Hello and welcome to your history. This is a crash course esque podcast that will dive into the details of local personalities and events that make up our national history. Our second episode focuses on someone who contributed greatly to the armed struggle of our country in not a very fashionable way. It focuses on someone who played a huge role in formulating the music industry in the country. But I think most importantly, we're focusing on someone who just wanted to entertain. And entertain right. We're talking about the legendary Jackson Kayewa. The Namibian newspaper had the privilege of speaking to many people who knew Kayewa and summed up the interesting life of this marvel act. So we start out in May of 1953 when a pregnant woman and her family members are involved in a vicious car accident that kills almost all of them. Now the family members of this pregnant lady obviously are worried that her child is not going to make it. But just as sure as the rain will fall one day, two months down the line on July 3rd 1953, a thunderstorm hit the town of Kunz and a baby boy was born and named from these two events. The boy was named Munigandu by his father and this means fortunate one and I guess he's obviously in reference to the car accident that he miraculously survived from. The boy's grandmother also named him Yamipuo which means the one born in the flood. However today and for many years we know the boy as Jackson Kawiewa. Now, raised by his parents, when Jackson turned one, he and his family moved to Okavikauda, where he lived there until he was about three years old in 1956. And in his autobiography that he wrote himself, titled Tears Over the Desert, Kawiwa describes how the adults around him would always sing church hymns that they were taught by missionaries um, when they became intoxicated. I think these moments were one of the first moments that sparked a musical interest in the life of a young Jackson Kayoa. The following year in 1957, Jackson moved to Onoiva, which is the same year his favorite uncle, Katamuna, died. This was around the time that um, the young Jackson would witness, I think, important cultural moments, especially for him. He here witnessed his um, etando for the first time which is in the Herero culture known as a mourning ceremony where women conduct a ceremony to praise the deceased. In the same year, Jackson also experienced his first omikwe, which is it's a combination of signs that sort of occur which you feel um, in the body. They're basically premonitions that either mean positive or negative things. In Jackson's case, he had a dream that a certain member of the community would pass away which actually turned out to be true as the following day there was news that this certain member did indeed pass away so i think he he most probably developed these things or experienced these things quite prematurely and i guess there's a debate within the african culture that you you are supposed to experience these things um sort of at a later age so that you understand them and experience them wholeheartedly as opposed to them happening to you prematurely and not really know what is going on but anyway years down the line at seven years old the young Kayewa then attended his first school at Komnarib in 1960 he however did only last a year there and then moved to Cess and attended school there he did finish school at Cess in 1968 and then moved again to Kietmanzop to find employment in 1969 after looking for a job there he was finally offered something at the department of veterinary services as a coffee boy and he does, it, it does say in his book, open quote, I ran errands like a mad dog. I often wondered what the use of a job description was, in the quote. About two years later in 1970, still under the apartheid regime of course, blacks were then forced to move from their spaces to areas that were allocated to them by the apartheid government. Kayowa and his family being Herero were moved from Kietmansop to Herero land along the northeastern part of the country. 
and a year later he was then again shifted to Vinduk to help out his father at Eros Airport. Um, his father worked as an aeroplane cleaner and a fuel attendant. The young Kayo, however, would not really get paid more than one or two rands for helping out. Um, his father then did persuade him to join the municipal police, which he succumbed to, and his main job there was to go around the location to look for people without passes. Back in the day, that wasn't really the most prized job to have, but I guess it was a job nonetheless. I think it's fair to assume that before his adult life started, Jackson was already carved and polished as a cultural man because it had so many jobs already. It moved around, you know, cross country. So I think the person he became, the cultural marvel that we got to know, whether that was through his music or through any form of of of, of entertainment or through any lens that he allowed us to look through. I think all these movements cross country and all these jobs that he had really injected a sense of culture because as far as I'm concerned with the research I did, the man spoke Herero, which was in his native language. He spoke Damranama, he spoke Oshiwambo, he spoke Afrikaans as well, he spoke English. He had a fair sense of the other indigenous languages in the country as well. The man had a tongue of many languages and I think that's all attributed to the cultural experiences that he was fortunate enough to have just before his adult life started. <clears throat> you are talking, sugar. Mm. Talking about the old location. That would take me back to the 1960s. You know, mm. I used to come from the south, you know, get my swoop chest, fall fast like uh-huh. Kansabari. I uh-huh. would come with my mom to the old location in Windhoek. You know, and we would listen to guys like, you know, Varamcha, Harihuru, Leiden, to mention a few. And this was the vibe mm. those days. After applying and getting admitted into the Dorky House, to study music, Jackson traveled to the then Transvaal province to Johannesburg, the city of gold. I don't think he was aware at the time that studying music involved reading and not just playing music instruments, producing or singing. So he was quite shocked uh, to find out that he was enrolled into a beginner's class and was not given any accommodation at the small institution. But fortunately for him, he knew Namibian footballer at the time, Herman Pele Blaschk, who was based in Soweto, Blaschk offered him accommodation for the rest of his stay in Joburg. And while there through Blaschk, Jackson befriended Kito Petru's uh, Tenten and Zimande and other players from Kaiser Chiefs. He was, however, expelled from the country for anti apartheid activism. Now, after his return from Johannesburg, he was under the watchful eye of the police as his political position became just a bit more evident. He was eventually arrested at work for writing a politically motivated letter to the Vinduk advisor and the special branch were just not impressed with it, I guess. So shortly after that, the then versatile Kayewa again landed himself a gig to read news in Ocherero. The gig, however, only lasted him one day as he didn't want to use the term Ovatirive, which translates to the word terrorists. I think alluding to his fellow comrades or quote-unquote brothers and sisters in arms, as he does say in his book. So after this gig didn't go so well, his positions became more pronounced when he started bringing politics to the place of worship. Kayoa would perform gospel songs in independent African churches, which luckily at the time allowed everyone to preach and I think after being given the space to sing, he would sometimes deliver, you know, these political sermons, which would obviously raise questions among the congregations. There were whispers about Jackson being mad and getting the church into trouble. And I mean, and I mean, all these whispers would echo among the benches. He does write in his book that he once heard people asking, does he think politics is food? So obviously he did that freely and with good intention, but... 
I think even then it was still quite dangerous in as much as the church was somewhat of a safe space. It was still dangerous to fight using the instrument of the church just because of how scared people were. Life was already so bad so people came to church to worship, to find peace, go home and hope for the best for the next day. However, Jackson came with a different agenda. And this agenda, again, like I said earlier, became more pronounced in the years following. I mean, from 1975 to 1988, he was exiled in many, many places. After a short time in Botswana, the Swapo resistant movement, which he was associated with until his death, helped him to move to the UK, where he soon became the lead singer of the group Black Diamond. Now, from the international success did follow with songs such as Winds of Change. And um, while in exile, he did carry the spirit of the liberation struggle by singing songs that were meant to uplift soldiers and civilians in exile. He traveled to Kwanzaa Sul, to Ethiopia, to Germany, and many other countries where his band would sing around the camps and in concerts. And in the refugee camps in Angola, Jackson actually was a teacher also, and he did compose many songs that were related to the struggles of many African nations that were fighting for independence at the time. It really wouldn't be such a bad thing to, by virtue of all of this, then assume that Jackson's political position, coupled with his love for music, number one, pushed the country into a state of liberation, peace and independence. And number two, were the driving force that created the music we love and listen to. Till this very day. So after his rich experiences abroad in other African countries and in exile, Kayewa arrived back home just before independence, between 1989 and early 1990. And I guess he, in my opinion, deservedly so, after carrying the spirit of the struggle on his back, performed at the Independence Stadium on March 21st, 1990, when the country officially became independent and was officially known as the Republic of Namibia. Now, Kawiewa was back in a free and liberated Namibia. He had achieved his objective. Although many perished and or sold out during the liberation struggle, he still managed to keep the hopes of people in the camps in Kwanzaa Sul and in Zambia and other African camps alive through his music. He practically kept the torch of their hopes burning till the finish line in 1919. But he himself wasn't finished. He still had a strong passion for his first love, which was music. However, because the country was still in its infancy stage, so was the music industry. Jackson was practically in a group of liberation struggle singers that were left with the task of identifying a music industry for a country who was yet itself still identifying who it was as a people and as a culture and what its position in the world was. Now, to be quite honest and fair, there isn't much to tell about Jackson's life post-independence. Father Time unfortunately did not play into his favor. The responsibility of establishing a music industry while trying to be part of the music industry perhaps proved too much for him. I saw in a September 2006 interview he did with a daily newspaper, Kayewa said that the music industry in the country was a limited one, one with limited buying power. And in his own words, he says, it's quite small here, but at least it's better now because in the early days of independence, a music industry was non-existent. Now mind you, he said this 16 years after independence, so you can imagine that there was still not much to work with within the industry. 
According to reports, Jackson also did not live the fruitful life most expected him to live post-independence. He lived a very orthodox life, making most of his money from performances and royalties. He would sometimes, because of the love he had for music, pull out his guitar and start performing in the middle of town, and people would willingly throw money into his hats or guitar cases. Otherwise, he sustained himself through adverts, jingles, article writing. Sometimes through connections, he would go perform abroad as well, either alone or with upcoming Namibian artists in Europe and America for festivals and other such events. Some would say, and I, I would agree with him as well, that he was unconsciously, slowly but surely building the industry that he never fully benefited from. Throughout the early 2000s, the public constantly made calls to officials and authorities to employ Jackson in a government position of some sort, in order for him to obtain the life they feel he deserved. These calls, however, fell on deaf ears. Jackson's contribution to the music industry and to the liberation struggle was, however, recognized with the first ever Namibian Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2002 Sanlam NBC Music Awards awarded to him. Now besides this, as mentioned earlier, Jackson lived a pretty ordinary lifestyle, as he was often seen catching taxi like the ordinary Namibian man. He died like the average Namibian in a state hospital from kidney failure on May 27th, 2010. Not everyone saw him as an ordinary man though. People worshipped this man. They loved him, they adored him, they thought he was spectacular. Veteran director Sandy Rudd actually collaborated with him in 2006 to realize a wonderful idea for a musical on Kayawa's life. The production was the brainchild of Rudd, who had been flirting with the idea of presenting Kayawa's biography into a full-scale theatre production. She says she always thought of the story of his life as an interesting one and that it would be quite a wonderful theatrical piece to study. She also said that the idea was driven by her curiosity in Jackson as a person and as an artist. The production was called The Lion's Roar and can still be found on YouTube today. Now besides Rudd, many members of the public and artists in the industry have also eulogized Jackson for being a man of many talents, for being a musical father figure, for being this larger than life character, you know, with a big personality, big voice, big cultural element to him. I remember reading an article where renowned and decorated music artist Gaza also described him as one of his personal heroes. He recalled occasionally seeing him sitting at bistros in Post Street Mall, often playing his guitar and socializing with people. In the same article, um, Hikwa pioneer Sunny Boy also added that he remembers Jackson as the founding father of the music fraternity. He mentioned that Kayo inspired him and a lot of people to want to be musicians. In addition to that, Joseph Gabriel, who is the technical manager of the Ndilimani Cultural Group, also said that Kayewa was one of those people that deserved a hero's funeral of some sort because of the contribution he made to the struggle, the contribution he made to the industry and the contribution he made to the Namibu society as a whole. Another wonderful example of just how much people loved him is after his first hospitalization in November 2009, efforts were sort of galvanized by the Swapo Youth League and the National Union of Namibian Workers to gather funds for his medical expenses. This unfortunately did not capture the right attention. Matter of fact, it caught little attention. Kawiewa was survived by four children and his most famous child, Jackson Kawiewa Jr., 
who was born in Angola along with his twin sister, had many songs with his father and told the Namibian that his father was the best father that one could ask for. So, there you have it. Jackson Kauyewa, a liberation icon, a father, a Namibian, and my God, a giant of an artist. <laughs>